All right, we're going to work through another DFT computation of a discrete time signal. In this example, we're going to work with a discrete time signal that is infinitely long in time. It starts at time zero, and it goes to the right for forever. So I'm calling that an infinite sequence because it goes on in time for forever. And we're going to start off again by doing some kind of pen and paper analysis, and then we'll wrap up the problem in MATLAB as we did in the previous examples. So let's work on the DFT of an infinite length discrete time signal. The particular signal I've chosen here is x of k, and it is equal to 0.8 to the k u of k. So the unit step turns the signal on at time zero, and then we have this decaying 0.8 to the k as time k gets big. What we're going to do here is we're actually going to go ahead and compute the DTFT. So the DTFT is x of omega. And then once we have that known, when we compute the DFT in MATLAB, we know that the values that we compute for the endpoint DFT should lie on top of this curve that we compute here analytically. So let's go ahead and compute the DTFT. That's pretty easy because alpha to the k u of k is a signal we encounter all the time. So we can just go to our DTFT table and we know that its pair, its frequency domain representation, is this signal right here, 1 over 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega. So we know what x of omega is for this particular example. Our alpha is equal to 0.8. So that is my equation right there for the DTFT of the infinitely long signal x of k. Let's go ahead and compute what the theoretical amplitude spectrum, we're going to take the magnitude here. So let's compute the amplitude spectrum of the signal. Finding the magnitude of a complex quantity is easy. I just take the quantity times its conjugate and then the square root. That's the definition of magnitude. Here, x of omega is 1 over 1 minus 0.8 e to the minus j omega. And then if I conjugate it, I'll have 1 over 1 minus 0.8 e to the positive j omega. So this is just me plugging in x of omega and the conjugate of x of omega. And now if I multiply this out, first, outer, inner, last, do my kind of high school algebra distribution there, I end up with these terms right here. I have a total of four terms. This last one is nice when you multiply those. The uh, conjugates cancel out, and you have 0.64. And then 1 plus 0.64 is 1.64. So I can write that right here. And then these terms actually add up nicely. I have an e to the j omega, e to the minus j omega. So that makes me think of some type of sine or cosine, and indeed if you do the uh, simplification there, you can convert that into a cosine of omega. So this right here is the DTFT, and if I was able to compute an infinite number of samples in MATLAB, I would end up with DFT values that end up right on this curve. However, I can't deal with an infinite number of discrete time samples in MATLAB. I'm going to have to truncate it in time, and that's what I mean by the endpoint DFT. When I go to MATLAB, what I'm really going to be dealing with in MATLAB is this right here, x of n, where I've taken samples of x of k, n values, from k equals 0 up to n minus 1, and then 0 otherwise. So as capital N gets very large, obviously, this signal turns into x of k, but I can't let n be infinity when I do the MATLAB. All right, so that's it for now. We've kind of uh, come up with the uh, DTFT of the signal and right here. We know what the amplitude spectrum should be. Now when I go to MATLAB, we'll actually be dealing with this, and we'll compute DFT coefficients for this signal. And as n gets large, those coefficients should look more and more like the DTFT that we've computed here. All right, let's go ahead and do the MATLAB for this example. We're looking at an infinitely long discrete time signal of the form a to the k u of k. So this signal starts at time zero and goes to the right forever. Obviously on a computer, I can't you know, evaluate this signal at an infinite number of points in time. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna use this parameter k max that controls how far in time we go out. So for now, I just have it equal to seven. So we'll only evaluate times 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 initially when we plug into this equation right here. And I'm going to go ahead and set A to a value of 0.8. So this is a decaying signal that goes to the right. Let's go ahead and start running this. looks very similar to our other scripts. We'll compute how many samples are in the discrete time signal. 
We'll compute the uh, sampling frequency, 2 pi over n naught. We'll go ahead and initialize a vector for our DFT coefficients. And then here is the double for loop, just like before, that computes the DFT one value at a time. So for one value of r, we compute n naught values and store that in this first entry. And then for the next value of r, now we're computing x sub 1, which is the DTFT co DFT coefficient that corresponds to 1 omega naught, etc. So if we let that run, we'll eventually have all of our DFT coefficients computed. And then right here, I can go ahead and compute the theoretical DTFT. So the DTFT is a function of omega, which should be an extra right there, is a function of omega. So this is a continuous valued function. Again, on a computer, we can't do anything continuous valued, but I have constructed omega to be so finely sampled on the interval 0 to 2 pi that it will end up looking um, continuous valued. So let's go ahead and get back down there again. So I have two quantities computed so far. I have my DFT coefficients. I have my DTFT of the infinitely long signal. The other thing I'm going to do right here is I'm going to compute the DTFT of the finite length signal. So both of these are um, DTFTs, but this first one was assuming that the signal went on for forever to the right. This one assumes that it actually stops at the value of Kmax that we set up here. And then what I can do here in my final figures, I can plot these three quantities. Now let's go ahead and plot that and see what it looks like. Here's what we have. The blue line right here is the DTFT of the infinitely long signal. So that's you know really the signal I want to work with. The black line is the DTFT of the finite length signal. So that's after truncating it down to n naught values. In this case, n naught was eight. The black curve is the DTFT I get for that finite length signal. And then the red dots are the DFT values. Remember the DFT gives us values or samples of the DTFT. So in this case, we're actually getting samples of the black curve because I'm dealing with a finite length signal. So what I expect to see are these red dots right on top of the black curve. Obviously, neither these red dots or this black line lies on top of the blue curve because we've truncated so much of the signal and thrown away so much signal content. However, what should happen is as I let K max get bigger, as I'm truncating less and less and letting my signal that I'm working with here in MATLAB get longer and longer to the right, what should happen is the black curve and the blue curve should converge. And that's exactly what happens. I went from um, K max of seven, which was n not equals eight values, to a Kmax of 17, which is now 18 values, and we can see the blue and the black curve are looking much closer. So, and, and, and still, the DFT values are on the black curve, and they always will be. Let's go ahead and do one more value here. Let's go up to like 170. Let's like make that really big. And now we can see what happens. Now the black curve is almost identically on top of the blue curve. In fact, can I see any difference at all? I keep zooming, eventually I'll see some numerical differences. If I subtracted those curves, I'd probably have some epsilon numerical differences on my computer. But now those values look very, very close to each other because I'm not really truncating anything anymore. Well, I am, but the things that I'm throwing away are so close to zero, they have very little impact on the computation. All right, so that's it for now. Another example of using MATLAB to compute DFT values. Remember, DFT values are samples of the DTFT. In this case, we were working with an infinitely long signal, so we had one extra concern of since it's infinitely long, we have to truncate it at some value, and we played kind of some games with seeing how as we truncated it, the DFT values we got weren't really on the curve initially because we were throwing so much information away, but as we truncated less and less, the values that we're getting for our DFT lie closer and closer to the DTFT curve that we wanted. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching.